All right, my friends. How are you this uh, evening? It is the 2nd of October, 2018, and I uh, wanted to share some of my thoughts about what was going on today. Hi there. Santiago, you are first. Welcome in. Gather around, my friends. Let us chat about the day's events in America. Some wild stuff going on. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Pile on in. Don't you wish we had a nice flickering fireplace, some skillets, some s'mores? I don't know if you uh, guys know what s'mores are. They are an evil little tasty North American treat. You get your graham crackers, you get your melted marshmallows, you get your chocolate, you get another graham crackers, and then basically you just dial an emergency dentist after you eat. So they are tasty and diabolical. I guess like leftist addictions to coercion. So thank you uh, everyone for dropping by. Wonderful to see you. I'm just going to wait for a second for people to drop in. S'more philosophy, please. <laughs> okay, that's good. I needed a laugh today. That's, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Uh, nice, nice to see that. Uh, and uh, let me just think I can detach this window. Pop up chat. There we go. So yes, nice to see you guys. And um, what's up? Quite a day in America. Hi from Montana. Hello, Ruth. Nice to meet you. Looking good, buddy. Yeah, I got to say, not bad for past a half century. Still got a jawline. I can't quite get that. Lacey Ford. <laughs> anyway. All right. So, all right. We'll wait till we kick into a K and then we'll get started. Just wanted to say hi, everyone. <laughs> hi from Perth. Oh, Perth, Washington. That's right. That's like London, Ontario. Oh, and listen, I do want to apologize to the people who have uh, been bothered by my swallowing sounds from my coffee cup. I do apologize for that. I will try and back off. Did I get a haircut? <laughs> You're assuming that I have enough hair to go out and get a haircut or... <laughs> I do it at home quite a bit. It's just faster and easier. Every now and then I'll just go get the back of the neck trimmed because uh, you know what happens when you get over 50. Well, actually for me, it was when I got over 25. You uh, you go to the barber and you say, well, well, over 50 for sure. You go to the barber and you say, well, I guess there's not really much we can do with the top, but you mind trimming the ears and maybe digging in there with the nose and a flamethrower spelunking outfit or something like that because the hair no grow where you liked it to grow, but it sure does grow where it's mostly <laughs> inconvenient. If I were breastfeeding, I would come with milk and floss, which I guess would be kind of useless if you were a baby. Grow a big beard. It would look cool. Well, then you're going to have to come over and kiss me because my wife's not so keen. The eyes of an eagle and a hairline to match. <laughs> that's good. Oh, that's good. What is ASMR? What is that? I see that all over the place. Uh, you know, let's just chat for a few minutes before we get to the topic. Get your electric clipper, save the money. Yes, well, that's uh, that's what I do. It always amazes me because I don't really see my hair, right? Oh, yeah, listen, we'll start off with the exciting topic of my hair. So because I don't really see my hair, when they do the me me like all around, I'm always kind of amazed when I stand up and I'm underneath the chair is all of this, like it looks like little bits of steel wool and stuff because, you know, I guess I'm kind of gray on the side, right? And uh, it's pretty funny, you know, like there's a lot of hair. I just don't really see it, uh, not that much. Uh, hello from Venezuela. Oh, man, I hope you guys are doing all right. What shampoo do you use? Um, yeah, I use a, oh, what's it called? Ah, it'll come to me. But <laughs> let's just say not a very, uh, not, a, not a lot of shampoo, what it, what it is. Oh, people whispering into a microphone? Is that ASMR? Oh, Dr. Ford's court voice, that's ASMR. Yeah, oh man, that's sad. Am I related to Pat Condell? No, <laughs> no. Stefan, I enjoy this type of engagement. Please do it this more often. I would like to, and uh, I will. And I think, yeah, we got enough, right? We have enough? Of course, yeah, we're way, way north of a, of a thousand. ASMR equals hypnosis, basically. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. Hello from Nashville. Hello. I listen to ear massage ASMR. Very nice. All right. Well, it's going a little fast for me. Is there any way to slow this down? I don't think there is, right? 
Finally caught one of your streams. I'm still kicking myself. I'm missing the Q and A streams. What are you gonna? Are you gonna do any? Yes, I will do uh, some tonight. I of course certainly appreciate if you want to help out at uh, freedomainradio.com/slash/donate. Also, of course, if you would like to uh, do a super chat, just let me know. Uh, I guess it'll show up. Oh, David, thank you very much for your <laughs> super chat. I'm just going to keep saying super chat until I can retire. Ah, uh, who's kidding who? I'm never retiring. I'm never retiring. I will be. I'm going to to get a little microphone installed, maybe a little video system installed in my coffin, just in case, just in case I come back to, uh, uh, I come back to life. So, all right, let's uh, talk a little bit about what's going on. Um, I got some notes. So, do you guys know about ricin? Ricin. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about ricin. It's a uh, pretty wild stuff. Apparently, it's produced in the seeds of the castor oil plant, which seems to be a rather evil little vegetable. Ricinus communis. Huh. Communis. It's just one T short of accuracy. It's a highly potent toxin. A dose of purified ricin powder the size of a few grains of table salt can kill an adult human. I guess I'm all right. The median lethal dose of ricin is about 22 micrograms per kilogram of body weight if the exposure is from injection or inhalation. So that's 1.78 milligrams for the average adult. Oral exposure to ricin is far less toxic. This is from Wiki. As some of the poison is inactivated in the stomach, an estimated lethal dose in humans is approximately one milligram per kilogram. So why are we talking about ricin? Because... There was, well, a couple of scary packages floating around today, which I'm sure you are aware of and have heard about. And uh, it is, uh, yeah, you know, Daniel, when your last name is that, <laughs> Tremblay, I'm pretty sure I know that you're from Quebec. But yeah, let's, uh, so a highly toxic poison, ricin is suspected in mail sent to Trump, Defense Secretary and Navy Chief. Chief, there is no Cure. So an envelope suspected of containing ricin was sent to President Donald Trump, officials said today. It is at least the third incident in which the highly toxic poison was suspected was suspected inside an envelope sent to government offices. The envelope was intercepted by Secret Service officials on Monday. The suspicious envelope did not enter the White House and was not received by Trump staffers. In a statement, the Secret Service said, it is working with other agencies to investigate the letters to Trump. The agency said it typically does not comment on, quote, matters of protective intelligence. A second envelope was sent to Defense Secretary Jim Mattis, who was traveling in Europe this week. A third was sent to the Navy's top officer, Admiral John Richardson, a defense official, said. The letter sent to Mattis and Richardson entered the Pentagon. The mail screening facility is on the Pentagon grounds, but separate from the main building. So... That's that's pretty nasty, all this stuff floating around in the mail system. And that's um, a couple. And then Ted Cruz, who uh, as a Hispanic is notably called, I'm sure, fairly often a white supremacist. But Ted Cruz's office in Houston today was evacuated after exposure to white powdery substance. A package addressed to Senator Ted Cruz's Houston campaign headquarters caused a lockdown, a spokeswoman for the Republican said. Authorities later lifted an evacuation order after saying two people were apparently exposed to a white powdery substance. The Houston Fire Department tweeted Tuesday that tests for hazardous substances were negative after the building floor where Cruz's office is located was evacuated. No one from the campaign staff was taken to the hospital. Package was opened to the lobby. lobby. Authorities locked down the lobby and elevator for a couple hours. So, yeah, a whole bunch of packages. Uh, the Pentagon say, of course, two of these packages were believed to contain ricin. This one, I suppose, was fairly innocuous. But that's where things are. That's where things are. And it is really quite astonishing because... I mean, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure, given who's in power, where all of this stuff is coming from. I assume it's coming from the left. Could be wrong. Could be wrong, but I don't think so, especially given the Republicans' uh, rather unfortunate love affair with the military. So where is it coming from? It's coming from the left, I think. 
And this is the next and inevitable escalation. Like, where do we go? Well, after Kavanaugh, you're going to have to be accused of pedophilia. And if that doesn't work, well, these things are going to start to happen. And it really is amazing, you know, this is the whole problem with a free society. And it's a whole problem with what happens when the stakes have become so high in the government and in the status system under which we labor and are pillaged from. Because what happens is it's so easy to disrupt. Look at the cost versus, like the cost of inflicting versus the cost of attempting to prevent. So you just put some powder in an envelope, you mail it off somewhere, and people get evacuated. The whole place is in lockdown. You've got to consume resources. It's what is it to mail something in the States? 50 cents these days? 50 cents, a couple of pennies worth of baby powder, and boom, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, if not more, could be tens of thousands, some of delays, of, of bypass, of problems, of this, of that, just crazy. You can't have a civilization where people start taking this as the way to go because you can't fight it. You can't, oh, we're going to find someone and trace it and track it down. Then you've got to spend a huge amount of money prosecuting, and you've got to then spend a huge amount of money incarcerating if somebody's found guilty and so on. The cost versus the destruction, very, very low cost, very, very high destruction. And this imbalance, if the West starts to go this way, if the West starts to go this way, and there's no indication that this may not be the star. <laughs> something tells me we're into something new. And uh, if this starts to go this way, society is always just a very, very thin edge away from barbarism. And we can see this kind of barbarism with the Kavanaugh hearings. We can see this kind of barbarism in these uh, attacks. We can see this kind of barbarism when people get together with their MAGA hats or get together to talk about uh, conservative issues or at least non-leftist issues. You can see this seething, gathering violence. So it's impossible to predict, although I'm sure it is going to be a trend. Getting Kavanaugh in, if Kavanaugh gets in over the next week or two or however long it might take, that's not the end, you understand, right? That's not the end. That is, that is a signal for the next round of escalation. That is a signal for the next round of escalation. And I do not think that the left is going to de-escalate. And as they ramp up, the right is going to ramp up. And we've seen this before in history. This is in particular the Weimar Republic battles on the street between the Nazis, the brown shirts, and the communists, uh, or the black shirts. And the moving back and forth is, you know, the Nazis, the communists, two sides of the same coin. In fact, like I mentioned this on the show before, it's just one of these little historical bookmarks that's really important to remember. A communist was called a beefsteak, which was brown on the outside, but red on the inside, right? And they were just communists just wearing brown shirts. They moved back and forth consistently. Hitler loved socialism, National German Socialist Workers' Party. The supposed big right-wing fascist Mussolini was an out-and-out -out Marxist for many, many years many years. And this moving back and forth, these are just two sides of the same crime gang, two sides of the same collectivist gang. One is on race, one is on class. Now it's on identity politics. It is uh, horrendous. And the important thing to understand about all of this, all societies, just like all individuals, have big challenging decisions to make. Which way do we go? How are resources allocated? How do things work? And how do we resolve them? How do we, how do we say where resources should be allocated? All human desires are infinite. All resources are finite. So how do we decide where we allocate our resources? Well, the answer generally is the free market. Like the moral answer is the free market. Where should a mall be built? I guess if malls are even being built anymore. Well, there's no central planner that should make it happen. There's just supply, demand, risk, incentive, you name it, right? 
So that's how things work in a free society. How much money should be put into charity? Like if you want to help the poor, then giving them money may not help them that much. Giving them jobs won't help those who can't take jobs either because of physical or mental disabilities. So how much should be put into wealth creation and how much should be put into wealth transfers? It's a really important and challenging and big question. I don't know the answer. Good news is neither do you, neither does anyone else in particular. This is the constant experimentation. How much preemptive defense actually turns out to be the instigation of attacks? This is another very, very important question. Because I understand, you know, if you've got all of these ships sailing to your country and they're warships and they're going to invade, then yeah, you don't want to wait for them to land. But at the same time, <laughs> If you go and invade Iraq because there's a fantasy that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction that can reach the United States, well, turns out, funny story, the Department of Defense is really just the Department of Imperialism, and that didn't work out so well for anybody involved except for a few rich sociopaths in the military-industrial complex. Oh, don't you just wish it was only a few? So how do resources get allocated? How do resources get allocated? How do they get created? Because when you transfer resources, generally they diminish. When you invest resources, generally you can grow them. It's complicated. You can't save your whole life. You know, there, there is these crazy people. I'm sure you've read about them. And, and they're hugely rich, but they live, they rent a room in the back of some dingy old place. <laughs> I remember when I was in university. This is when I was taking my master's degree. I lived... Um, <laughs> I live pretty close to the bone. My rent was $275 a month, utilities uh, all included. I don't think there was internet back then. I had a modem. Oh, yes, I had a modem. And I used to be able to dial in and reserve books into the university on a 386 SX25 megahertz. And gigahertz? Why no? Megahertz computer that I got for $1,200, just like just about everything I'd saved from uh, a Toronto computer company. I used to dial in, get my, reserve my books. Then I go to my little tiny cubby office and read and oh, it was lovely, read and write. But I lived so close to the bone. I had one little room in a house and out back of the house was a slaughterhouse. Like when they were sluicing stuff off, I don't want to get too graphic, but it was, it was bad, man. It smelled. And a friend of mine knew a little bit about the history of the place. So there used to be a lead smelting plant back there and all this kind of stuff. So there was lots of lead in the soil. So the idea was you just, uh, it's a cheesy idea and a bad joke, but you, you know, you grow a bunch of fruit and stuff. You give it to your landlord. It's so full of lead that he has memory problems. And then you say, no, 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 I already gave you the rent. I, I already paid. Oh, okay. That's, uh, things getting kind of fuzzy. So yeah, how many resources should be there? How many resources should be applied to what? It's really, really hard to know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows why you need freedom. How do you allocate scarce resources? I don't know. I don't know. All resources are scarce. So then the question is, if we have a free market, then you can influence things, right? So you can start a charity. If you think that there's too much job creation and not enough wealth transfer from people who can't take jobs, then instead of going out and starting a company and hiring poor people, maybe you start a charity and you get people to give you money, which is money not going towards creating jobs. And then you give that money to the poor people to help them out. Because it's not fair to just say, well, we're just going to create jobs because there are some people who, I mean, I, I remember when I lived at that place, there was a woman who had, uh, yeah, she had, I mean, such stability challenges, let's just say in terms of personality. I mean, it was hard to imagine that she could just go get a job, just go get a job. It's not, it's not particularly possible in, in the short run, hopefully in the long run, right? So do you help people with their emotional problems? Does that enable them? Does that make things better? Does that make things worse? Do you then just go out? I mean, it's really complicated. It's re and nobody knows the answer. And that's why we're supposed to have a free society. Who has the best arguments? Well, well, obviously. You don't mean to be a brag. I'm bragging. What's that? Oh, yeah, some Louis Armstrong song from way back in the day. St. James Infirmary? I'm bragging. Anyway, I think I have great arguments. A lot of the world agrees, and some of the world disagrees, <laughs> quite strenuously, I might add, as well. 
And it is free speech that allows us to determine which arguments generally hold sway over a period of time. So nobody knows. And that's why we need a free market. That's why we need freedom of speech and all these kinds of good things. Nobody knows. Because if we're not using reason and evidence to resolve our disputes, we have only one thing less left to do, which is force, which is violence. If you can't reason with people, if you can't provide evidence, if you can't negotiate with people, force is your only option. Resources are going to be transferred in society no matter what. They're either transferred nicely or not so nicely, but they're sure as hell going to be transferred one way or another. So the question is, why is the left gravitating so much towards violence? Well, because it's worked really well. It's because it has worked really well, the destruction of reason in the West. The destruction of reason in the West. The West is largely anti-rational with glimmers and flashes and eruptions of rationality from time to time. So, I mean, you can sprint through this stuff fairly quickly. You know, the pre-Socratics, yeah, pretty anti-rational. You got Socrates and you got uh, Plato, you got your Aristotle, and we got a little bit of rationality that the mob largely snuffs out. And then you get the Roman Empire, which was not anti-rational, but was not pro-abstract rationality. It was pro-practical rationality in terms of like they built wonderful things and they had great architecture and they had uh, practical solutions to problems of irrigation and, and sewage uh, control and, and plumbing and so on, but not really abstract, philosophical, somewhat close to the technical expertise of, say, Japan and China, but without that creative fertility of ancient Greece. So then we had the fall of Rome, we had the Dark Ages. And the Dark Ages were the Dark Ages, not because society had collapsed fundamentally, but because Europe was constantly being besieged by Muslims, also known as the Saracens, who were in particular pirates, and, and Europe, Europeans couldn't live anywhere near the coast because they just got snatched and, and dragged off to the slave markets in the Middle East. So then you start to get a resurgence of reason um, post Martin Luther in the 16th century. Uh, and uh, then you get all this religious warfare. You get the age of uh, reason. Well, you get the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the age of reason. You get peak rationality. You get a free market. You get stocks being traded. You get, uh, Mises said that the fundamental characteristic of free market is a stock exchange. So you get all this great stuff. And the anti-rational forces, of course, they don't like it that much, right? They just don't like it. I can kind of understand why from that perspective. Because if you're anti-rational, I mean, you're committed. You hate reason. And the reason you hate reason is no rational person would give you the time of day, right? Come on. I mean, Marx couldn't even get a job as a clerk in a railway station, for God's sake. <laughs> no rational person was going to give Marx the time of day. He had horrible carbuncles. He barely bathed. His beard was full of ungodly things, and his maid was full of his ungodly Marx Wang. And then he, after she got pregnant, he just dumped her out in the street without even giving her back pay, if I remember rightly. So the anti-rational people, they've been working very hard for about 150 years, 160 years. They've been working very hard. And you have the pseudo-rationality of Marxism. Oh, it's scientific. It's a scientific explanation of human history. And then every single one of its predictions fails to come true. So then, <laughs> it's like, like global warming. Anyway, so then what happens is when Marxism fails to materialize in terms of its having any predictive power, they say, oh, well, you see, the problem is science is rational. Marxism isn't scientific, therefore, rationality is bad. <laughs> so terrible. It's you, you know, Oh, did you fail your math test? Just redefine math to be completely incomprehensible and anti-rational and anti-empirical. Yay! Progress in human thought. So they've been working really, really hard because Marxism has utterly failed in, in theory, in practice, in 
descriptions of history and descriptions of the present and descriptions of the future, Marxism has utterly failed. And so they just have to remove the standard of rationality so that you can't ever apply it against an anti-rational ideology like Marxism, com communism, collectivism, and so on. So they just tear up rationality, they tear up reason, they attack, they oppose, they attack, they oppose. But they want, but they want. They need, they want, they grab, they're greedy. So resources have to be allocated. Rationality they hate. The free market they hate. What is left? The fist. It's all that's left. The threat, the attack, the brutality. That's all that's left when you continually deny reason. And you say, well, gee, why... Why did, the la why did the West let this happen? Why did we give up this great treasure of rationality and science and the free market and objectivity and truth and philosophy? Why did, why did we give all of this up? Why? Well, we had great universities and the universities were infiltrated by Marxists and then they kind of surfed the prior value that the universities were perceived to have, the prior reputation, they kind of surfed it. And uh, people couldn't stop paying them, even when they turned out to be terrible, because it was all government funded. That's all government funded. So that's how the rot spread. And they are, you know, they're they're patient. You know, it's funny because sometimes I think that you know this R versus K stuff. If you've watched the Gene Wars presentations I did some time back, Gene Wars, G E N E Wars, very very important. To watch that, so you think, oh, you know, they're very short-term thinkers. It's like, ah, they've been planning for a long time. They're very good at instinctually knowing which lines of thought are going to threaten their reputations, their powers, their control, their muscularity of influence. They know very well, know very well. Oh, this person's rational. They are a threat. This person promotes rationality. They are a threat. We got to take them down, take them down, take them down. And everything that they use to take down a good person is exactly stuff that they've claimed they don't believe in anyway. It's exactly stuff they claim they don't believe in anyway. You mean the left says, you've got to believe women. Now, it'd be great if we could get another 10 million Muslims in here, wouldn't it? Because Sharia law, you understand? They don't care. Keith Ellison, he had accusations. I hate to use that word credible because credible has kind of been discredited by the overuse of the word credible in non-credible situations. But anyway. Keith Ellison, Democrat, Minnesota, right? Minnesota. A couple of his exes, I think it was, they're holding up like uh, 911 calls. They got medical records. They got texts. They got photos of them together saying, this guy's abusive. An investigation occurs. And it was just yesterday or the day before, I think it was, where the DNC said, nope. Nope. We're not going to continue doing any more investigations because, you know what? There's no objective proof. At the same time, at the same time that the Kavanaugh hearings are going on, the Democrats are saying, well, but with Keith Ellison, see, <laughs> there's no objective proof. Well, first of all, there are certainly objective supporting documentation. Let's put it that way infinitely more supporting documentation than anything Blasey Ford came up with. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care. No interest. The same people who say there's no such thing as objective truth say, by God, if Kavanaugh told a lie, then he is unfit for the Supreme Court. But you guys don't believe there's any such thing as objective truth. Yes, that is true that we don't believe there's any such thing as truth. But if he didn't tell the truth, well, he can't get on the Supreme Court. <laughs> you understand? They don't, they don't care about any of this stuff. The Marxist professors say we hate those who exploit the poor. The helpless, the subjugated, the controlled, we hate those who exploit them, who take their money without providing anything of value in return. The Marxist professors say this all the time. 
the leftist professors, the collectivists, the socialists. We hate the exploitation of the underclasses. Now, Jimmy, if you could just slide on up here to the booth and sign promissory notes for about $30,000, which you can never really pay off, at least not easily, and you certainly can't get rid of if you declare bankruptcy, so that we can teach you how to hate your gender, your race, your sex, freedom, your history, your culture, the West. <laughs> but boy, isn't it terrible when capitalists underpay, underpay their workers? Yeah, but they don't indoctrinate them into self-hatred while ladling them down in almost impossible to discharge debt. If you were that space alien I talked about last time and you came down and you looked for who was exploiting the poor the most in the West, well, it would be the Democrats with the welfare state and the Marxist professors with student debt, student loans. They don't care. They don't care about any of this stuff. They just make, they know other people care about them. You know, they know other people care about this stuff. They know other people have a moral sense. And uh, yeah, this Kavanaugh stuff, it's such a wild story because it's such a completely obvious story. Now the story, of course, is that, well, if, uh, what's it, Scott Palais talking to uh, Adam Schiff and some bald guy Oh, uh, no, it was the 60 Minutes. And if Kavanaugh told one lie, is he unfit for the Supreme Court? It's like, well, they'll, they'll find something. They'll find something. They'll, fi they'll find something that he said, well, you know, it could be misinterpreted or it could be this way or it could be that way or whatever. And then, ah, you said that if he told one lie, he was going to be unfit for the Supreme Court, so you can't vote yes now. And they'll hold you to your word. They'll hold you to what you said. Although, of course, they constantly break promises all the time. Don't worry, you see. Communism is going to lead to a stateless society and a pure egalitarianism and massive amounts of wealth for the working classes. Oh, wait, sorry. Uh, asterisk. Uh, all that's false. Massive piles of body, economic destruction, and social and cultural degradation. Complete destruction of just about everything you hold dear and then some, and you get to starve to death while ruining every time that anyone ever opened up the Communist Manifesto. So they will, they know that you care about your honor and you want to keep your word. So they'll extract promises from you so they can get their fish hooks into you and control everything you did. But they don't care about promises. <laughs> they don't care. Higher education is very important. It's going to really help you succeed in the work. <laughs> they don't care. They just make all these promises. They don't care about any of these ethics. And if you're in a situation with someone, and you're the only one, like you're in a conflict with someone and you're the only person who cares about ethics, <laughs> guess what? You're going to lose. You're just going to lose because they have a electric eel, worm-like, well-greased kind of flexibility and you're stuck. You're stuck in your honesty and you're stuck in your integrity and you're stuck in your honor. They care about power. They know that other people care about virtue. They don't care about virtue at all. I mean, it's so it's almost boring to point out, and I'm sorry for being so ridiculously obvious, but they don't care. They don't care. They don't care about any of these things at all. So when you look at things today, where you get all these powdered envelopes being mailed out, first of all, it's probably coordinated. Can't be a coincidence. It's probably coordinated, which means that somebody wants to have all of this start to go down. And it means that if this starts to escalate, imagine if 20 or 50 or 100 of these get mailed every day. Imagine what happens to society if 100 powdered envelopes get mailed around a day or 1,000. It's not hard to coordinate. I imagine. What happens to society? What happens to healthcare resources? What happens to emergency response teams? What happens to people's willingness to open their mail, <laughs> right? You understand? Because this stuff's so small, you can just 
go up to someone's mailbox. You can open up a little thing, just if a standard piece of junk mail or something. Just it's crazy. Oh, somebody's asking what happened with the powdered envelopes. Was it three or four were mailed out today, or, or landed today over the last day or two in the U.S. One to Trump, one to a senior naval guy, one to the Pentagon, one to um, Ted Cruz's office, I think it was. So crazy stuff. It just takes a couple of dedicated people sending out these letters and what happens? What happens? I mean, we've seen a wide variety of ideas about how these things can happen. I don't want to discuss them in particular, but we all understand that we are this close to chaos and decay. This close. Civilization is a very, very thin line, my friends. It is a tiny net that is cast over and restrains the reptilian and the animal within us. And it does not take much to overturn it. It does not take much to overturn it. So, can't find these people probably. Can't control what's coming next. They'll wait for a little bit. People will get relaxed. See, the, the whole point of these kinds of attacks is you also want to, I mean, maybe they won't, but you want to give people a bit of time to relax so that then they become jumpy about relaxing. You know, like when you're in a, you're watching a horror movie and things are calm and people are happy and they're chatting, you just know someone's going to come in through the curtains with a meat cleaver. I mean, it's just inevitable, right? I mean, they tend to train you to be jumpy about relaxation. So, yeah, it is a whole mess. It is a whole mess. And the media, the festering... Mm, I'm trying to be nicer. I'm not saying I'm succeeding <laughs> in my own mind, but well, the, the media, of course, by this is the whole point. The whole point is that you continually, you continually call people Hitler so that unstable people will then do your attacks for you, right? You're just goading, constant goading. It's one of the greatest characters in Shakespeare is Iago, who keeps whispering into the ear of Othello, how Desdemona, his Wife is unfaithful and drives him mad. And then he ends up, well, you'll, you can see it if you haven't already, but uh, yeah, this is what they do. They just keep portraying, oh, he's, he's, he's Hitler, he's a national, white nationalist, he's a Nazi, he's this. And then everyone's like, what would you do to stop Hitler? Well, a a anything and everything, right? The whole point of this, mad, like once you've escalated to the point where you can't escalate any further, calling Judge Kavanaugh a mass rapist, there's not... Much of a place to go from there in terms of escalation. So once you've done that, well, you keep painting that laser and then crazy people are like, I want to stop Hitler. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm all for free speech. But I mean, the laws are terrible in, in the United States. I mean, the laws are terrible in the United States in terms of uh, if you're a public figure, it's almost impossible to do anything about things like defamation. I mean, it's, it's very, it's very hard. Like you have to show actual malice. And I mean, and of course, everybody who wants to say bad things, they, sorry, I'm just going to move my leg here. They already know that, that you have to show malice so they'll never record it. And right. It's, it's I mean, yeah, free speech is good, but this, uh, this stuff where you can just say anything about anyone and this stupid court system takes years and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, yeah, they can do whatever the hell they want and they can say whatever the hell they want and crazy people will take that in and the crazy people will... <laughs> you know, uh, I yearn for the days when the voices in the heads of crazy people weren't just CNN. <laughs> but yes, right? Ah. <sighs> So, but good news for us, the good news for us is that if it wasn't for the internet, we'd have lost already. We're just hanging on, fighting back. And if it wasn't for the internet, we would have lost already. If it wasn't for these conversations, if it wasn't for you wonderful people listening and sharing and supporting and donating, if it wasn't for us, 
we'd have lost already. If it wasn't for the internet, there'd be no Trump. There'd be no pushback. There'd be no Gorsuch. There'd be no Kavanaugh. If it wasn't for the internet, a conservative party would not have won in Quebec, Canada for the first time in, I can't even think how long, a hell of a long time. They want to cut immigration by 20%. You know, that's 80% close to good. If it wasn't for we few, we happy few, we'd already be plowed under. We'd already be plowed under. We'd already have lost. It's the only chance we have. It's not a great chance, but it's better than zero. So I'll take it. All right. Enough of my rambling. Let us move on to the glorious listenership. And uh, Sapanta, I say ta for your super chat. Thank you very much. Very kind. Jeremy Spencer, that's very kind too. Thank you so much. Corey Bennett, thank you for your super chat. He says, how do I deal with the problem of high status? My girlfriend has many virtues, but is overweight. How do I deal with my childhood neglect that causes me to be embarrassed by my girlfriend because she doesn't appear to be high status due to her weight? Why do you think that it's a problem to be embarrassed by a fat girlfriend? You should be embarrassed, embarrassed by a fat girlfriend. I mean, I'm going to assume, Corey, let me know if I'm wrong, but I'm going to assume that you have higher status than your girlfriend. In which case, the relationship he will not work. <laughs> it will not work. Uh, water finds its own level, right? If you're high status, then your girlfriend is either going to come up and meet you on high status, you're going to fall down, she's going to drag you down to her level of status, or you're going to break up. That's all there is. <laughs> no other option. And you can waste time, and you can circle the drain, and you can nag at her to lose weight, and blah, 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 but doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We, we can't. It's like... It's like all these faux feminists, these men who like pretend to be feminists and turn out to be just grabby, nasty groups of <laughs> because they're high status in their world, and high status brings in it a certain amount of masculine uh, spray and pray. <laughs> Let's just put it as nicely as possible. So if you're high status, well. Your high status is going to get chipped away every single time you're hanging out with your girlfriend in public. Your status is going to get chipped away to the point where you'd be like, well, I guess we've now ended up at the same status because you know the way it is. We're all different. We're all different in terms of our status and our confidence and our abilities and, and so on. And people are either going to encourage you to come up to their level or they're going <clears> to <throat> drag you down. They're going to encourage you to come up to their level if they're above you and they're good. <coughs> Excuse me. Or they're going to drag you down to their level and dissolve you in their own neuroses and insecurities. So, I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, there are some people, <laughs> what is that old Dennis Leary joke? People say, I'm big boned. No, you're not big boned. Dinosaurs are big boned. You're just fat. So if she's overweight, it's a big dysfunction. It's a big dysfunction to be fat. It's unnecessary. It's embarrassing for those around you. It's bad for your health. It's bad for your reproductive capacities. It's bad for your hygiene. It's bad for your joints and your knees. Like, you know, the 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 plump, chubby, happy girl <laughs> who may have developed other skills to make up for that. Well, it's one thing when she's 25 and just kind of like a Rubenesque, as they say. I don't think that's after Dave Rubin in particular. It could be. I think he posed for Caravaggio. Anyway. Um, but it's quite another thing when she's 75 pounds overweight. She's 50 years old. She's got no libido, no sex drive. She's got strange smells. She can't climb stairs. She aches. She got aches and pain. I mean, God, why would you want that for the second half of your life, man? Plan ahead. Stop living in the blur of the now like we all do when we're in our 20s. Look down the road. Is this what you want? Oh, she's overweight. Well, what if she loses weight? Well, if she loses weight and she's substantially overweight, she gets those curtains of fat hanging down to her knees. Seriously, look at the stuff if you dare. 
But these women who are very overweight and then they lose a lot of weight, oh God, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And then you have to deal with the neurosis of somebody who's lost weight. They might gain the weight back. They permanently programmed their set weight maybe to something higher. And then they got this fold, this folds of skin hanging. They got to go in for surgery for all of that. It's very expensive, lots of recuperation. And then if she ever gains weight, her skin is too tight. And it's like, why would you want any of that? My girlfriend has many virtues. <laughs> yeah, I think I have an idea what they might be. But uh, no, don't, uh, don't do it. Don't do it, man. It's, uh, it's a bad idea. It's a bad idea. All right. James B. says, what do you think about Trump's proposed bump stock ban? Won't this lead to a total ban of firearms? Well, of course, that's the goal of the left, right? They, they, can't, they can't expand their power if everyone actually has weapons. So, of course, they want to. This in itself won't, but it's, you know, it's that war of inches. It's that war of increments, right? Uh, the bump stock ban. I've heard some wild stories about what happened in Las Vegas. I heard one of them just in St. Louis this last weekend. So isn't that where it came from? Was the bump stock ban came from from uh, Las Vegas, uh, from the shooter? The anniversary, right, just happened. So you just got to stop appeasing, right? I mean, you got to stop appeasing, and it's now a year since Las Vegas happened, and nobody has any answers at all, which means that they have answers that they don't want to reveal. Without a doubt. You, you can't miss that much when you have that many resources focused on a particular event. So they have answers. They just don't want to reveal what those answers are. And we may never find out. Liam Adams, thank you uh, so much. David Bergerson, thank you. Steph, I am unable to ethically defend government. What should I say to folks who insist we wouldn't be able to function without it? Thank you. Well, you can use analogies, which can both shock and enlighten at the same time. So you could say when slavery was the natural function of the human economy, nobody could imagine how society could function without slaves, right? Without slaves. How could be public? Who's going to pick the cotton? Who's going to dig the ditches? Who's going to do that, right? So if you uh, get people to sort of accept and understand that they're in the position of saying the existing structure of society, I can't imagine what it's like to not have the existing structure of society, well, then they're, they're in the ethical position of defending slavery. Slavery was ethically indefensible, of course, morally re repugnant and reprehensible. Well, we can't pick cotton without it. Sure you can. In fact, you'll pick it a lot better because you'll have giant mechanized robots sucking on the juice of prehistoric squished up trees in order to comb over huge acreage and do it automatically, right? Oh, what are we going to do without this cheap foreign labor? Automate more? You know, there are grape picking robots. There are strawberry picking robots, strawberries, the only fruit with seeds on the outside. There's just that little bit of trivia for you today, my friends. Wouldn't be able to function without it. You can go even further back and say, do you know that uh, at certain points in human history, Rape was really common, and that's how babies were made. Pretty much masses and masses of people were herds of rape babies all over the place. You know, like a leftist view of your average college campus or frat house or whatever. Rape, rape, rape. And then, well, you know, consent and, and female control over reproduction and so on all began to develop, right? So if you say, if you live in a rape society... And people, I shouldn't laugh. You live in a rape society, and then you come along and say, you know, rape is uh, rape is really horrible and immoral, and it's a violation, horrible violation of of people and, and women and so on, right? And then they say, well, I mean, without rape, where would we get people from? It's like, you know, there are other ways to do it that are more moral and nice, you know, like combine harvesters to deal with crops in the field and marriage instead of rape you know lots of different ways to do it and if people are just like well i can't picture any other way to do it it's like okay well then they're just part of the big giant herd of humanity who is born and lives and dies and leaves no mark in the world stop wasting your time with people who can't even imagine anything different than what is ah. <laughs> sorry well i won't be nicer i'll try uh right um i don't know Okay, so Adam Sturr says, do the people in the chat room consider joining Intellectual Dark Web New York City meetup group? 
I uh, won't give the link, but I'm sure you can find it. And uh, I, uh, I endorse nothing. <laughs> uh, uh, Ang Harad two fifty six says, "Stefan to fat girls, don't try. You're already too damaged, and no man should ever want you." Well, it depends what you mean by fat. I mean, if I mean, I, I'm not Brad Pitt. There, you know, I can pinch an inch. Don't get me wrong, right? So, I'm not saying. To, to, I mean, if you're morbidly obese, yeah, like, sorry, I mean, I, I mean, you can lose weight and you can be healthy, you can have a decent life and so on, but yeah, you're, you're messed, you're messed up, right? But no, the whole point is don't let yourself go that way, you know? I mean, and and if your parents are fat, then recognize that you have fat genes and, and you know, I'm no nutritionist, I'm not trying to give anyone any advice, but, you know, you got a tendency, like, okay, so... My my father gave me virtually no useful advice in my life other than don't marry a woman like my mom. But the one piece of advice or observation that he did give me while I was when I was already an adult, he was visiting and we we had a rousing game of squash together. And um, when we were having a coffee afterwards, he said uh, something like this. He said, you know, it's kind of easy to gain a pound a year. Pound a year is not much, like an extra bite of toast a day or whatever. Pound a year is not that much, but you know, from like 20 to 60, that's 40 pounds. That's a lot. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess I didn't really think about that. And I guess it was about 10 years ago. I was, I, w I was heavier. Uh, I probably weighed about 20 to 25 pounds more than I do. And you can look at the old videos. It's not, I'm not obese, but you know, I'm certainly not slimish right so and i remember thinking about that with regards to my father and i remember thinking okay well that was a good point now i mean it, i guess what was that 10 years ago i was i'd have been 42 so that was yeah that was about 20 about 22 years 23 years almost a quarter century since my last hard labor job you know working up north and all the stuff i've talked about before gold panning prospecting and all that so in about 25 years, or about 20 years, I'd gain 20 to 25 pounds. It's kind of easy to do. All you have to do is just keep doing what you always did, and you'll gain weight because your metabolism slows down and you can't process food as well. So I hadn't really changed anything. I mean, I still exercised and I ate what I'd always eaten, but, you know, you, you, you know, like you blow up the balloon and up it goes. So... I was not, you know, uh, overweight to the point when I just had to change everything, you know, and it sucked. I got a sweet tooth. I'd be straight up with you. I grew up in England, you know, I had an abusive childhood and you, you, you get your pleasures where you can, right? And sugar was one of them. So you just, I mean, for me, I'm like, okay, well, I, I got to lose weight. And I, I was aware that people lose weight and then they say, yeah, I lost weight. I can have some cheesecake, <laughs> you know, and just stupid stuff, right? So... What you got to do is you got you got to change a whole lot of stuff, and you got to never go back. That's all. You got to change a whole lot of stuff, and you can't ever go back. It doesn't mean you can't ever have a bite of candy or or a piece of cheesecake or whatever, but you just can't go back to the way that you used to be. You just can't ever, ever. And so I am one of the two to three percent of people who has lost weight, and not a small amount, not a huge amount, the twenty twenty five pounds. And I've kept it off. And I've kept it off. And what does that mean? Well, it means I don't have dessert. <laughs> I mean, I like dessert. Don't get me wrong. Just can't have it. I'm trying to think of the last dessert that I had. Just sort of pop it into my mind. Uh, oh, well, um, it's my birthday. So I had a couple of bites of cheesecake. It was really nice. But I can't have a piece of cheesecake. And that was about it. You know, um, when my daughter has Halloween candy, she'll offer me, you know, like one of those little mini candies. And I'm like, oh, that's good. I'll take that. Right. But I just don't eat sugar the way that I used to. In fact, I barely eat sugar at all. And I used to like um, diet soda. Nope. <laughs> Can't have it. Oh, what can you have in this wonderful new world of hedonism? Ah, well, you see. If you really want something bubbly, you can have a little bit of soda water and you can squirt some lemon in it. Mm. <laughs> That's not as good. Oh, no, it's not. But 
and you switch to wraps instead of full subs if you're having something out and, you know, just the usual. Don't order an appetizer. You know, just if you're hungry, you fill up on something that doesn't have a lot of calories or sugar, you know, a bowl of Cheerios or whatever, right? So you just got to change and you can't change back and it's better. It's better. It's nicer, you know? That's an old thing that says nothing tastes as good as thin feels. Fair enough. So, no, I'm not saying don't try. I'm saying, first of all, don't let yourself get that way. Don't let yourself get that way. And if you can lose the weight and, you know, some people don't, if you lose weight young, I think your skin is more elastic. Is that right? And and so it pops better into shape and so on. But, yeah, look, I'm sorry. Like, if you're 75 pounds overweight and you're 40, I don't know. I don't know. So, no, I'm not saying you're already too damaged. No man should ever want you. I'm saying deal with it. Deal with it and and have a better life. ANCAP Kool-Aid. <laughs> so ANCAP is anarcho-capitalist. ANCAP Kool-Aid. It seems like society has lost its understanding. Why innocent until proven guilty? No understanding of a society where you're guilty until proven innocent. Right. Why is innocent until proven guilty so important? Because the whole point is to reduce crime and unjust accusations of criminal behavior. The whole point of a just society, of a fair society, is to reduce crime. Now, my recipe for reducing crime is peaceful parenting, right? And, and don't put your kids in the brain-crushing satanic mills of government schools and so on. But the whole point, is you reduce the amount of crime in society. And if you have innocent until proven guilty, then it makes false accusations harder to maintain. Now, of course, what should happen is false accusations should be punished to the fullest extent of the law. In other words, you should get the same punishment. If you falsely accuse, say, a man of rape, you should get the same punishment he would have gotten if he had been found guilty. And this should be pursued assiduously to reduce the amount of crime. This is the weird thing with these Kavanaugh, Lacey Ford hearings. You know, she was victimized. We don't know that. We don't know. I don't know if she was victimized at all. Vast majority of women who are sexually assaulted before they reach adulthood, the vast majority of them are sexually assaulted by someone in the family, in the family or the proximate family. So I don't know. I don't know if she was. It certainly doesn't appear to be anything to do with Brett Kavanaugh. Brett Kavanaugh. Because you go screaming out of a party, disheveled, hysterical, sobbing, past a whole bunch of people, and it's a, not even a party, it's a gathering. You're basically going out. You're screaming your way out through half a dinner party and no one notices. Come on. Come on. That's, a, that's stuff we're supposed to believe. So yeah, innocent until proven guilty recognizes that we wish to, as a just and fair society, we wish to reduce the rewards of false accusations. And the rewards of false accusations can be extraordinarily high. The rewards of false accusations. You feel wronged. You're kind of crazy. You hate someone. I mean, boom, right? You're politically scared of what they might do on, say, the highest court in the land. So, yeah, these things can lead to false accusations. And false accusations are incredibly destructive. Incredibly destructive. And a more calculated form of destruction than even a crime of passion. They're first degree, in my view. So, yeah. You have to have innocent until proven guilty. And that way you diminish false accusations to the point where accusations become more credible. But you know what happens? You have a society where you have innocent until proven guilty. You don't have a huge rash of false accusations. And then people are like, well, you have to believe people because, you know, we haven't had a huge rash of false accusations. And then you have a huge rash of false accusations. And people are like, whoa, we got to change this. We got to fix this. We got a lot of false accusations. Then you go, you go and tamp all those down and you prosecute people for false accusations. Then the false accusations diminish. And the people are like, wow, false accusations are really, really low. I guess we can just trust everyone now. <laughs> right? The whole stupid status cycle starts all over again. Robert Molloy says, keep up the good work. Enjoy your program. I think that means he enjoys the program, but I'm going to say that it means both of us should enjoy the program. Thank you very much. Blake Foster says, have some ideas for the show. Steph, talk about phasing out Social Security, Medicare, the math of marriage slash divorce with children and how it affects the wealth inequality that the left speaks of so much. Love you, brother. Well, thank you very much, Blake. That's very, very kind. You know, 
This is something Harry Brown with an E used to say on his show when people would say, you know, he would talk about privatizing government education and people said, ah, it would be chaos. And he said, ah, it'd be chaos for about a week. It'd be chaos for about a week. You know, people would start teaching other people in their garages, you know, like people would start teaching people online. Like it'd be chaos for about a week. You can phase this stuff out. Medicare, wasn't it? I think the math is that people have worse health outcomes on Medicare than if they have no access to health care at all. It's terrible. You understand how economics works, right? Free health care means taking less care of your health. And then it turns out because fewer people are taking care of their health. Like, let me just give you the brief math, and it's all made up math, but I think it's illustrative, right? So let's say that 75% of people take good care of their health. Okay, so healthcare is relatively inexpensive. And so you give, hey, free healthcare, it's not going to cost us that much. So then there's free healthcare. So then what happens is only 50% of people take care of their health. Why? Because it's free healthcare. Some people, you know, there's a lot of lonely people out there. A lot of lonely people out there who go to the doctor so that someone will listen to them and they have someone to talk to. So only 50% of people take care of their health. And then, right, your your price goes through the roof for a health care. And so, yeah, I mean, it it everything you touch changes. It's public choice theory, right? Everything you touch changes enormously. You take a snapshot of society, say, well, we're going to, going to change this giant variable. And then it's going to be like the same as it was before, just with this giant variable change. It's like, nope. You say, oh, well, you know, back 50, 60 years ago, only 2% of white children were raised in single mother households. So, you know, for the sake of a couple of hundred million bucks, we can make those households very comfortable. And then the kids won't grow up in poverty and it's only 2%, so, eh, right? And then what happens? So, you know, as well as later, what happens? What happens is you say, oh, we're going to give free money to single moms. And people are like, wait, what? Wait, I don't have to put up with this guy farting in the bed and <laughs> scratching his junk all over the bedroom and, and leaving wet towels on the floor and crumbs on the kitchen floor and not closing the fridge door properly and chewing the top off the milk bag like some rabid jackal on a dead woman's boob. And it's, you know, and it's like, I don't have to put up with this. I get free money. And then you go from 2%, boom, to over 50% in a couple of generations. And then you're in a challenge, right? Because then what's happened is, you have women who are following lust rather than reason when it comes to choosing the father of their children. And given how much criminality is associated with genetics and environment and so on, you end up with a lot of mess. <coughs> a lot of mess. And then normally what governments do is go to war, but they can't really do that anymore. So diversity. So, yeah. Good ideas, Blake. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And let's see here. What else is going? Oh, yeah. So if you want to throw me in a super chat, we got uh, we got a space or two. Yes, I visit Canada once a year. We drink milk from a bag. <laughs> it's true. It's a little odd. I did have a girlfriend who really, really was bothered when I would <laughs> vampire open the milk bags. It was something maternal deep down, I'm sure. Uh, Geo Minus says, hey, Stefan, adverse childhood experience score of nine here. Does the alien feeling of not fitting in anywhere ever go away? Yes, it does. Yes, it does, my friend. And I am very sorry for an adverse childhood experience score of nine. That is just astonishing. And I give you enormous sympathies. It does kind of put you in the category of that which does not kill you makes you stronger. And as long as you use all of that violated youth and innocence to make sure that nobody gets to do anything like that to you ever again, you can actually end up with a better life than people who weren't as harmed when they were young. Conservative Kiwi. Ah, I think I recognized you. Uh, wait, did I just miss something here? Sorry about that. Let me just find my way back down here. Oh, yes. Hello from New Zealand, Stefan. You're doing God's work. Do come back someday because New Zealand is waking up by the day. Love and thanks from down under. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess the conservative Kiwi is not the nom de guerre of one Patrick Gower. Uh, you should have a look for Lauren Southern and I taking on Patrick Gower on some television station and watch his stuff afterwards. It's pretty wild. Uh, Je, 
<coughs> sorry, thoughts on nationalism and how we could get there. Mm. That's a big topic. So feel free to ask me a little bit more. Uh, you, I'll look for it, just put it in all caps or whatever, but uh, I don't really know how to answer that at the moment. Polar Baron says, hey, Stefan, I think the left wants to absolve themselves and others of responsibility to the right wanting the acceptance of responsibility. What are your thoughts on the matter? Okay, let me try that again. <laughs> I think I may have scanned that a little too fast. Oh, no, I'm ASMRing people. Hey, Stefan, I think the left wants to absolve themselves and others of responsibility to the right wanting the accepting of responsibility. Ah, yes. Okay, yeah, well, well. Ah, the accepting of responsibility is one of the great counterintuitive things that human beings have to do in order to have a successful life. Because, you know, when you when you frack up, when you make a real giant mess, our first instinct is, it wasn't me, it wasn't my fault, it was someone else, you told me, you told me this, right? And, and you just want to take away responsibility because if you have responsibility, I think it's not so much that you fear attack like self-attack, it's just that if you take responsibility, what often happens is you get attacked by other people. And there's a lot of stuff, I've mentioned this before with regards to families, ah, some families, drives me nuts. It's a, There's a strong desire to avoid taking ownership of something in a family because then what happens is you become that guy, right? You become, oh, you drop a plate, right? And people are like, oh, you're so clumsy. And then if you say, you know, I, I take responsibility, I this, I that, I the other, then you become the clumsy one. You become the one who's always having accidents. You become, you get stuck in this box. And so the acceptance of responsibility becomes the diminishment of personality. You don't have any flexibility, no choice. You can't grow. You're just that one. Oh, she's the pretty one. Oh, she's the smart one. Oh, he's the clumsy one. Oh, no, 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 right. Oh, he's the sporty one. Oh, she's the bookworm. It's like, boom, just get stereotyped. And I've gone through a lot of different phases, as I'm sure you people have, introvert, bookworm, nerd, whatever, right? I mean, athletic and, and all of that. And you got to have that flexibility. But a lot of times when you take responsibility for things, oh, plus in families too, the more responsibility you take, sometimes as a kid, the less responsibility your parents take. So you're kind of training them to be more immature, which is pretty nasty. But taking responsibility is one of these things that we always want to avoid. And it's almost always bad when we do. Now, if we take responsibility, and that means taking big responsibility, and, and I'll get to that in a second. If we take responsibility, we get choices we don't have when we abandon responsibility or avoid responsibility. So if you have someone in your life, like you 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 make a mistake, you take responsibility and they grind you for it, like they just grind you down for it, like they, they, they oh, you've, you, you've admitted fault. I now have power over you. You've admitted fault. I can... I know where it hurts. I know where you're sensitive. I can put my thumb into that bruise. Okay, so you, you have to take real responsibility then, which is not just taking responsibility for whatever mess you made, but you got to take responsibility for having someone like that in your life at all. That's what I mean about super responsibility. You don't have people in your life who continue and continually punish you for taking responsibility. You have to expand responsibility to include why is, F why is anyone in your life? Why is everyone in your life? Have you chosen? Are they based on values? Is it virtuous? Is it positive? Is it helpful? Is it good? Because by God above, we can squander decades, an entire life, satisfying the petty desires of petty people. I, uh, I said in a novel that I wrote once called The God of Atheists, careless children can misplace... Socks, mittens, and shoes. As adults, sometimes they can misplace entire decades. Yeah, I almost speak from experience <laughs> with that one. Chasing the approval of petty people, allowing people to control you with negativity and hostility and abuse, and it's no way to live. It's no way to live. It's not even being alive. Have respect for yourself. Have respect for the truth. Have respect for your potential to not let it be crushed by the petty souls that are the real jailers of our actual potential. 2.22 a.m. here in the UK, and good old Steph is up alive. So he's a failed writer. There's your explanation. Well, that's interesting. A failed writer. Now, I've thought about that, too. 
I've thought about that too. He's a failed writer. There's your explanation. That's one possibility. And I get that it's the most likely possibility, so I understand that. But another possibility is I was such a good writer that I and I was not on the left. And so I short-circuited the leftist publishing industry and they did not want to publish me. Because I'll tell you this, my books are downloaded. The free books are downloaded over 100,000 times a month. I'm not saying they all get read cover to cover, you understand, but there's enough interest and certainly some proportion of them are read cover to cover. So yeah, over 100,000 books download downloaded a month. And that's a lot. You know, in Canada, a book is a bestseller if it sells 5,000 copies. 5,000 copies, 35 million people. Well, an increasing, increasingly few number of whom know how to speak English. But um, yeah, so it certainly is possible. Oh, he's a failed actor. He's a failed writer. And that's, uh, but, oh, a failed academic, right? But I'm doing pretty well on the internet. <laughs> right? I mean, my books are doing pretty well on the internet. And my conversations are doing pretty well on the internet. My monologues are doing pretty well on the internet. 600 million views and downloads. 863,000 subs. Pretty good. It's pretty good. You know, 10 to 15 million views and downloads a month. And that's just the stuff I can track. There's tons of stuff out there that's me. I can't even track it. So it certainly could be the case, you know. And I've, I've heard that theory before. Oh, it's bitterness as a failed actor, failed writer, whatever it is. Like, yeah, that's one possibility. But I'm sure if you've listened to my call-in shows, you've heard me do spontaneous monologues and role plays with people. Maybe I'm a failed writer and a failed actor. Or maybe, maybe I was too good for the environment. <clears throat> John Martin says, I never had a bedroom door with a lock and I'm 50 plus. Was that ever a thing? Just thinking about the Kavanaugh scenario. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so little about that Blasey Ford Kavanaugh scenario that makes any sense. Makes any sense. A bedroom with a lock, and I'm 50 plus. Bedroom door with a lock. Well, I don't know. I mean, privacy for a married couple late at night. But no, I mean, you, you want your kids to be able to if there's an emergency or whatever, right? So I don't know. Um, I've never had a bedroom door with a lock and I'm 50 plus. Was that ever a thing? I, I've i never heard or, or, or seen one. I've never heard or seen one. Think of the music volume. She goes up the stairs. I think she refers to them as short stairs, although all the stairs have to be the same height <laughs> to get up to the next floor. But... Um, the music is cranked up in the bedroom where she says the assault occurs. She says, he put his hand over my mouth and she was afraid of dying. And it's like, but he didn't cover your nose, right? If he didn't cover your okay, hand, over, we all know this when you're a kid, you're wrestling and right, play wrestling or play with a sibling or whatever. They put the hand over your mouth, but until they put the hand over your mouth and their fingers over your nose, you can still breathe. You got three breathing holes if you're not a porpoise. And um, the mu music is cranked up really, really loud to cover up her screams. Oaks. She runs out, doesn't talk about unlocking the door, hides in the bathroom. The guys go downstairs. She runs down. Who turned the music down? Is the like the music's cranked loud enough? Brrr, right up to the roof, right? This one goes to eleven. This one goes up to the roof, right? In terms not up to the roof, sorry, physically it goes really, really loud. Comes charging downstairs, runs out into the street, distraught, upset, frantic. Nobody notices anything. It's only four people at the party <laughs> other than her. And the music is still really loud upstairs. Come on. I think people would notice that. Joshua Crom says, I thank you for your continued effort in awakening me and others. I'd like to know your thoughts of overcoming alcoholism with a family of three. It's my girlfriend and her boy and her girl, too. My girlfriend and her boy and her girl, too. How's that a family of three? Family of three others, I guess. So if it's you overcoming alcoholism, well, addictions, this is the general theory as far as I understand it. Amateur time on the internet here, but this is the theory as far as I understand it. So 
you get a certain, we'll just call it dopamine, it's other things, you get a certain amount of joy juice in your life. And let's just say it's 100. 100 is, you know, average happy, you got some highs and lows, life's pretty good, and you got a 100. Now, when you get abused as a child, if you did, and I'm going to assume alcoholism is covering self-medicating for something, right? So you get abused as a child, what happens is your dopamine levels, your happy juice that gets knocked down, gets knocked down, and you end up at like 50 or 40 or 10. And that's like a difficult, anxious, unpleasant existence. And then, to take an extreme example, you do something like cocaine. Now, a normal person takes cocaine, they go from 100 to like 130, and then they settle down at 90, they get back to 100, right? So it's, you know, it's a, but if you go with 10, you start with 10 and you take cocaine and you go to like 110, you feel normal for the first time, probably in your conscious memory. You feel normal. It's not like people don't take drugs to get high. They take drugs to feel normal, to feel not miserable. The question is, why are you miserable? Because you've been abused, I would assume for the most part. So what happens then, normal person, like, you know, the people who were out uh, in uh, Vietnam, they got addicted to morphine, they got addicted to heroin, and the vast majority of them, when they got back to America, I think 80% of them or so, they just stopped using it, right? So if you start at a 10 and you take cocaine, you go to 110, you feel normal, slightly above normal for the first, and you're like, you didn't even know how much pain you were in before because you maybe masked it as the human condition. That the human condition is pain and suffering, and blah, right? Maybe that should be more Kermit-like. But so then what happens is you feel, oh my, this is what it's like to not be in pain. This is what it's like to not be horribly anxious, to have social anxiety, to be depressed. Like this is what it's like to be normal. And then what happens is you crash from 110 down to like five. And that's unbearable because now not only are you back into your horrible skin of discontent, but you're even lower than you were before, and it's unbearable. And then you're like, I've got to get back. I can't stand this now. I've got to get back. So then you take the drug, takes you 105, puts you back down to four, and this is the cycle, right? This is the cycle. Whereas people who are normally happy, they'll, you know, they'll have a drink or two, or they'll Occasionally, they'll get drunk, and you know it takes them maybe from 100 to 120, 125 in terms of happiness. They crash down to 80 or 90, and then they restore themselves. So they don't have a huge hunger to get back to the alcoholism. So if you have alcoholism, I imagine, related to child abuse or related to negative experiences or trauma or something like that, and you drink to self-medicate for the unhappiness, and the way to deal with the unhappiness, in my humble opinion, is... You know, journaling, self-knowledge, therapy with a good therapist, you know, just lots of guys, self-knowledge, self-knowledge. That would be my suggestions for that, and I hope that that helps, and thank you for the question. In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts is the book you want to read. In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts by Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E, Gabor Mate, who has the coolest addiction, which was to buying classical CDs. Anyway. But yeah, in the realm of hungry ghosts, well worth it. Joni Bologna. Joni Bologna? Bologna, Bologna, Bologna. Thank you very much. Very, very kind. I appreciate your support. Oh, Joni Bologna. Democrats haven't done SHIT for LGBT. A government that tells you what bathroom you can go in says what bathroom you can't go in down the road. With Trump's tax plan, I got laser hair removal for my Ass and legs, more than Obama ever did. Well, all righty then. I mean, it's kind of weird, right? Because on the left, they say, well, there's toxic masculinity and it's all rape culture. So now we've got to make sure that men can go into the little girl's room. It makes no sense, but it's all just chaos. Uh, uh, Sherwood L. Says, hey, Steph, thanks for doing the live streams. I wanted to ask. What do you think about what happened to Cody Wilson recently? My apologies. I'm going to just double check on that. The name is familiar. So I'm sure I'll be able to tickle my brain with a little bit of reminders. Oh, yeah, yeah. The uh, the, the guy who wanted the, the 3D printer uh, gun stuff. 
Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but, uh, you know, setups. Uh, setups could be occurring. You know, setups could be occurring. Uh, it's a dangerous time to be a free thinker. It almost always is, but it's a dangerous time to be a free thinker. So could be real. Could be a setup. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All right. Do another couple of questions. How are you guys doing this evening, by the way? Uh, somebody says, thanks for all your knowledge, Stefan. Over the past two years, my eyes and ears are now wide open, and I've learned so much from you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. The written envelope, Stefan. Yeah, didn't that? Uh, lamented guide. Hey, Steph, did you get any of my super chats? Oh, I may have missed them. My apologies. Let me just uh, <laughs> battle the scroll demons. Uh, oh, you know, I should be able to do a search here, right? Oh, look at me learning things on the fly. Let me see here. Do, 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 do. Stefan has clear hair. <laughs> it's kind of true, I guess. John C. Dvorak, too, just fired like that. I mean, I mean, he was around when I was knee high to a grasshopper talking about computers. You know, he has a whole keyboard designed to solve a problem that didn't really occur. And it just, I don't know, it's just odd. Gone like a Civil War statue. All right, hang on a sec here. Let me do my little, little psyche search. Blink. Uh, up, up, up. No lamented guide, I'm afraid. I got no super chats that I can see, and I can't. Let me just go through the top here. Sorry, this is really dull for everyone else, but I want to be uh, certainly respectful to the people who give the super chats. So nothing. All right, then give me a question or two more, my friends, before we finish out for the evening. Scroll demon. Uh, Mike F. Stefan, let's take women's rights away and fix society once and for all. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Come on. Being a woman is not a violation of the non-aggression principle. Being a leftist woman. Anyway, no. I mean, um, no, you can't take women's rights away. You'll need some big giant government to take women's rights away, and then they'll take men's rights away, and nobody will be free. And no, 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 no. You don't want any of that. You want to have a free society. You want to have a free... Women have so much power in society as wives, as mothers, as teachers. I mean, they have so much power in society that, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't get that. Somebody says, uh, I'm listening to Practical Anarchy. I can confirm you're a great author. Oh, yeah. So for those who don't know, I've got two free books. Uh, well, I've got more than two, but uh, Practical Anarchy is one. The introduction one is called um, Everyday Anarchy. And you should read that. And then Practical Anarchy is the how-to. And I appreciate that. I just, yeah, I just, um, I finished the audiobook reading of the new book. Oh, oh I got to tell you, every new book is my favorite. I love The Art of the Argument. But this one is my favorite favorite of all of my children. It's my favorite favorite. It's called Essential Philosophy. And it's, are we living in a simulation? It's how are the senses validated? It's how do you prove free will? It's how do you prove ethics? It's got a whole bunch of Socratic dialogues to teach you about debate. It's uh, it's great, says Tony the Tiger philosopher head. And um, I just um, I'm just sending it off to someone who's going to make sure the audio is as clean and as nice and as pop free. Uh, I've got a bit of a plosive habit with the breath, even though I remember to try to turn like that guy, <laughs> that guy with the weird video. Um, but, uh, yeah, it should be done, uh, relatively soon. And it's going to be my gift to you. Wonderful, uh, listeners and, and watchers, because I really don't want anything to stand between people and uh, philosophy. And uh, this is everything for me over the past 36 years, uh, really concentrated in a short, hopefully easily digestible, I think well-written, uh, package. And, uh, I'm very, very pleased with it. It was a lot of work and, uh, the, I actually, yeah, I read it uh, looking into the camera because I kind of wanted the eye contact. I mean, I assume people will obviously listen to it and read it as well. But if you want the eye contact way with the animation, which can really help, you know, 90% of communication is nonverbal. And I wanted all of the other emphasis stuff. What was it my friend used to say? Don't put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Anyway. Uh, Stefan is a German name. Molyneux sounds French. That is correct. I am half Irish, half German, 
The Molyneux has uh, definitely French origin. We came over with William the Conqueror in 1066 and were, I think, uh, fairly nasty people in charge of a bunch of peasants in Ireland for quite some time until my grandfather was an alcoholic. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the Kanye video, yeah, people show me that um, A Sunken Place is a reference to a movie and uh, the lyrics is a song mentioned sparkling water and so on, so. Um... Mike and Sarah from Kansas, we love watching your cognitive thought in action. Cheek smooch from me. Kiss, kiss. We worked oil field too. I think that's what you said right now. I was gold panning and prospecting, so not an oil field. That may have been a bit too much over me. Stefan, worm tongue equals the media. Oh. Uh, I can certainly see that. Stefan, will you ever visit Africa? Well, you might want to nail it down a bit. Uh, is, is zero in a little bit. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. It's a challenge, you know. For if you talk about race and IQ, visiting Africa can be a bit of a challenge. Talk more about social anxiety. Yeah, social anxiety. I think stems a lot from boredom. If you really engaged in a conversation with someone, like I've had this. Like so, I go uh, when I went for to various live events. Right, I go to live events. Love to sit down, chat with listeners, and talk all night. And very, very shy people, when you get them engaged in a conversation, their shyness generally vanishes and they really engage. So, so social anxiety might just be boredom, might just be boredom. Uh, Richard Meadows, have you seen the Trump rally? I'm at a loss to find anything he promised that he has done. What do you think? I think you can find places on the internet which have compared his campaign promises to what he's done. And it's not too bad a list. Certainly better than any other politician I can think of. What do you think of lobsters? They are tasty, but I do have to remind myself that they're not giant sea cockroaches because the moment I put them in the insects category, I feel a little nauseous and throw up a little bit of my mouth. So I do find them tasty. As long as I don't think of them as giant cockroaches, I'm good to go. All right. Uh, Self-knowledge, someone says, has got me to the point that I'm at least happy while being very disabled and drugged up all the time. I can live with that. I thought that would never happen. I am sorry to hear about the disability and the drugs, but I am very happy to hear about the self-knowledge. Not yet, Stefan. Do you mean not? <laughs> half Irish, half half German, half Irish, half French. Man, bear, pig. What is man, bear, pig? Is that an internet channel? Why does that ring a bell for me? Man, bear, pig. Oh, it's one of these tip of my tongue things. Let me see. Let me see. It was a YouTube channel. I'm not going to do it because it's going to play. But yeah, it was a YouTube channel, right? Anyway. All right. Sea and text. Sea and text. Oh, shrimp. I said, ah, shrimp is interesting because shrimp for me, again, as long as they're the insides and I'm not like, if they've got antennae and stuff, it's kind of tough to eat. But shrimp are, are very, very tasty. Dear Stefan. Oh, wait, wait. Ah, wah, 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 wah. Oh, here we go. Hey, dear Stefan, how can you have 100% certainty with anything without knowing and seeing everything or trusting a source of wisdom who knows and sees everything? For that, my friend Boris, I refer you to my upcoming book, available soon, Essential Philosophy. And there was one other question that I do. Oh, if somebody says, social anxiety is not boredom. It's fear of being judged by others and having it wrapped up in your own head. But you see, judgment is boring. Being judged by others is, is it's judgment is boring. Judge, I mean, don't get me wrong, I judge and all that, but in terms of intimate relationships, like people you'd want to go to a party with or a dinner party with, being judged is very boring because it's very, it diminishes you to one thing that people can say no to. And so I do think that if you're having, you know, the fundamental question or the fundamental statement in a love relationship is not, I love you, which can be faked. The fundamental statement of love is, tell me more. Oh, you had this, you had this thought, you had this, tell me more. You had this idea, you had, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. That's interesting. Judgment is, I'm done being told stuff and I'm just going to judge. And it's, it is boring and it's low rent. And if you're being, if you judge someone negatively in any foundational way, then don't spend time with them, obviously, right? I mean, this person is a terrible person. Don't spend any time with them. All right. I can't wait to buy your book. Well, you can't, <laughs> Daryl. Well, I guess I'm going to try and put out a um, uh, a uh, print copy of it, but uh, yeah, audio and, and video, and um, I'll put it out on uh, Kindle and all that. But no, it's going to be free. Hey, donations, very, very happy with it, right? So, all right. Have you ever heard about Logosophy? 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 No, no. 
What is the extent of your emergency preparedness, food, water, security, shelter, etc.? Pretty good. James P. Wait, the James P. What do you think of Trudeau caving on NAFTA after one week after basing uh, bashing such a big deal over Trump? Oh, I mean Trudeau is this I mean it's ridiculous. He's terrible. Uh, and uh <laughs> I mean he was not taking calls, and uh, uh, Trump was not even tapping him on the show. He was tapping Trump on the shoulder, wanting to talk, and Trump didn't want to talk to him because, I mean, he's a, he's a child. He's a child. Would Stefan ever run for office? I do not think so. I do think that I do the very best work here in this way that, uh, that I can. Uh, Joe says, I've met Stefan. He's a decent guy. Matthew says, love you, Stefan. I appreciate that. Does Trump have an ace in the hole before the election? I think he's relying on the economy to give him the mandate to deal with immigration after the election. And I mean after the 2020 election or the 2018 one. Wondering what you know about the Canadian milk cartel and the supply control. Oh, yeah, it's all it's all fascist commie nonsense up here in Canada, particularly dairy, a lot of farming. It's all terrible, terrible stuff. All right. Um Oh, Man Bear Pig is from South Park. Al Gore is still trying to find him to this day. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Gunrunner says, hey, Stefan, is your mother a Jewess? She is not a Jewess, Gunrunner. Uh, gun runner, sorry. So I said uh, many years ago that my mother came from a fairly Jewish clan and what that means to my knowledge. And I, at some point, should get someone to look all of this stuff up. But my knowledge uh, of the family history is that my mother's father, my grandfather, at one point was married to a Jewish woman and they, I think, remained fairly close after the divorce. So uh, my mother is not uh, Jewish. I am not Jewish, uh, but there's uh, a, a non-biologically related grandmother on my mother's side who was uh, Jewish. So uh, no, there's no matrilineal. It's just, you know, whatever, right? Uh, what do we do after Trump in 2024? It's uh, a good question. <laughs> Donald Trump Jr.? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It is, uh, it's a, that's a long way to look ahead, man. That's six years, you know. When you've had cancer, it's tough to look that far ahead sometimes. Uh, Sherry says, it's so wonderful to have you on YouTube, who is brilliant and balanced with your commentary no matter the subject. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, Jim says, thank you. Stefan, thank you for being a voice of reason in chaotic times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lamented Guide. Ah, here we go. She's put in three super chats. I am so sorry, my friend. I am so sorry. Thank you for your patience. I really I can't see them. Although I do get a chance to say, hey, I wonder what currency that is, <laughs> which I appreciate. So Lamented Guy says, Stefan Molyneux, I hate to be that guy, but I put in three super chats. Which philosophers do you recommend newbies start with? That's a great, <laughs> that's a great question. I actually want to do a whole history of philosophy, maybe even walking around in, uh, uh, in Italy and in Greece and, and so on, right? So... Uh, I would say Aristotle's not great to start with, but Plato is very disorienting to start with. The Platonic dialogues are very good to start with. I would also start with uh, some Ayn Rand. Uh, just, you know, uh, Atlas Shrugged is a great book to read, a lot of philosophical content, similar, more um, personal. But, um, oh, is it a friend of mine said? So We the Living, the Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, and We the Living, the heroes lost. In the Fountainhead, it was a draw, and in Atlas Shrugged, they won. It's pretty kind of true. So, yeah, I think that kind of stuff uh, is uh, is good. And um, from from those people, you and certainly after you've done those things, some Aristotle, read some Aristotle with commentary. Aristotle was probably a much better writer than we know, but none of his original writing has survived. And so it is uh, pretty tough to, um, uh, to, to know how good a writer he was, but a fantastic thinker. You just got to go really slow and go with some annotated stuff for sure, so... All right. Um, you know, these are fun. Another couple of minutes, if that's all right with you guys. Ever thought of coming to the States to give a seminar? Yes. Yes, I have. Is Canadian politics a lot more boring than the U.S.? Why don't we hear about Canadians talk about it much? Well, no. I mean, see, I didn't really talk much about American politics when, like, pre-Trump. There were some shows on it, for sure. But I talked about some Canadian stuff. But uh, there's not as much of an option in Canada as some people would like. Will the Republicans keep both houses? I don't like to make predictions about politics. You know, I mean, I was I was bullish on Trump, but I do not like to make predictions on politics because 
as I said, everything you touch uh, changes. So if I'm going to make predictions, like let's say, uh, oh, I'm 100% certain Trump will get in. Well, then people might say, oh, well, I'm not going to bother going to vote or whatever, right? So um, I will say that uh, I don't know. It really depends. The left is enraged and the left is hysterical because they don't have anyone who can fight Trump. They don't have anyone they can put up against Trump, right? So this is why they've, this is, I mean, the reason why they're doing all this crazy stuff is because, like, why, why are they going scorched earth? Well, they didn't go scorched earth with these allegations on Gursuk, but that wasn't close to a midterms. And I guess they still had some hope that they'd come up with someone to fight Trump in 2020. They got no one. And this is why they're going so hysterical. This is why they're turning to violence, because they, they don't have anyone. So the left is really, really energized to try and get the Dems back in power, or at least to help them get back into the House or the Senate. But it really depends. The, the Kavanaugh stuff as a whole is, is hollowing out the middle. And I hate to say that that's a good thing, but that's a good thing. So the, the kavanaugh Blasey ford hearings are radicalizing everyone. And radicalizing sounds like a very bad thing, except it's not. It's, it's a bad thing if you're a radical for anti-rationality and violence. It's a good thing if you're a radical for reason, truth, and evidence, right? Because there is no middle ground in these two positions. There is either going to be people go from one end to the other, but there's no middle ground. So the removal of the middle ground is essential for the victory of virtue. You have to get the middle ground out of the way in order for the battle lines to be drawn and for us to have hopefully this very relatively peaceful cultural war. I mean, that's what I want it to be. And, and, um, other people don't want it to be. So yeah, they are kind of freaking out uh, on the left. So the right is like, wow, these people are nuts and good. You know, th th this is why it's one of the reasons why I was enthusiastic about Trump was I knew that Trump would get in and the left was going to go insane so that people can see who the left really is before they gain political power over you. You sure as hell don't want to see who the left is after they gain political power over you because you kind of do it from behind barbed wire while being tortured in a frozen shack somewhere in Siberia or being driven out of the city to starve in the country like in Cambodia or eating the flakes that come off garlic and the feathers from your pillows and the bark from your trees in your garden like in China. So you need to see the madness and, and evil of the hard left. And I knew Trump was going to show that. What did he say right up front with Megyn Kelly? Megyn Kelly, he says, America's tired of political correctness. We just, we can't have this political correctness. But the whole, the whole point of political correctness is so you shut up about stuff that enrages the left until they gain political power over you, in which case they can discharge their venom by destroying you using political power. So the fact that Trump was going to go in like the proverbial bull in the China shop and just speak some truths about some damn things, <laughs> say some honest things and expose the media and expose the left, good. Now we know who they are before they get power over us. We desperately need that because the alternative is literally god-awful. All right. Uh, Candace Owens. Oh, man, she's great. She's great. Like, I I just, like, want to make notes. She's, <laughs> she's just... and very straight on, very passionate, and uh, just amazing. Johnny says, good evening, Mr. Molly. We love your content and your information. Glad to be here. All right. I think Gunrunner. Gunrunner. Cheers, Stefan. Thank you. All right. Shall we? How do we do for our numbers? Yeah, pretty good. We're over 4K for a bit there. Very nice. Very nice. All right hour and a half seems to be a good tidy session i i appreciate everyone's support if of course you're watching this later freedomainradio.com slash donate i really want to thank everyone for the super chats and for the general conversations i'm trying you know i want to make sure i get to general conversations for people who aren't doing super chats as well it is wonderful to sit here and uh, chat with you guys it is a real pleasure and you know there is a um Oh, all right. There's an important question here from Seth. Uh, any suggestions for someone with a bipolar 2? 24, six-figure salary, no unsecured debt, but still suicidal every day. Haven't found a med that works. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear about that. That is very, uh, very difficult. Very difficult. And I very much sympathize with that 
kind of torture in your mind. Obviously very intelligent, young and, and doing well economically. So I'm telling you, man, first place to look, first place to look is your early childhood. First place to look is your sense of security, your sense of love, your sense of trust, your sense of joy. Did people take pleasure in your existence when you were younger? Did people love that you came home? Were people happy that you came home? Did people rush to kiss you in the morning? Did, did Was there positive vibes going on? And I'm going to guess not. And I'm going to give you this, which uh, I've talked about many times. I actually had an interview with Dr. Vincent Felitti, who uh, helped uh, to, to, uh, to work on this kind of stuff. So here is uh, an adverse childhood experience score which is uh, very, very important to, uh, to go through. And it's not necessarily the questions that I would have asked, but they are uh, quite, quite helpful. And let me just see, I'm sorry, just having a little bit of trouble to, uh, to get these. I thought I had them bookmarked down here, but apparently not. And there are ways of beginning to evaluate where you are in terms of uh, uh, your your childhood. And let's see here, questionnaire. Here we go. Hopefully, the same one. All right. Um, I, this isn't exactly no. No, you know, I'm gonna try and find the one. Yeah, that's a bit long. It's a bit long. But um, I'll just do one more, one more try here. I thought this would be easier to find because Lord knows we've uh, talked about it quite a bit. And, and so there is a link between adverse childhood experiences and adult dysfunction, both in terms of mental health and, and physical health and so on. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, but it's, it's things like this. Um, did a household member go to prison? Was a household member depressed or mentally ill? But did a household member attempt suicide when you were growing up? Did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic or who used street drugs? Was your mother or stepmother often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her? Was a biological parent ever lost to you through divorce, abandonment, or other reason? Did you, very, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, you had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you? Or your parents were too drunk or high? to take care of you or take you to the doctor if you needed it? Did you often or very often feel no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other or support each other? Did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touched their body in a sexual way or attempt or actually have oral, anal or vaginal intercourse with you? Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? Did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? And um, this was from kindredmedia.org. I won't give you the whole link, but you can uh, look up the Adverse Childhood Experience Score. And if you score high on these things, then this may be a place to start looking at these things. So, all right. Wonderful, everyone. Thank you again for uh, a great evening. Always a great pleasure to chat with you guys. And um, freedomainradio.com slash donate. I hope that you enjoy the new book coming out soon, Essential Philosophy. I'm very, very happy with it, which hopefully means something and a great chat, uh, a great pleasure chatting with you guys. Lots of love from here. I'll talk to you soon.